<clears throat> okay, I don't know if I mentioned this last week, but but I'm going to ask you to go ahead and read um, the the text that we're going to study beforehand. And I don't think I told you today what that was going to be. But next week, um, hopefully, we're going to be in chapter three in the first part of chapter four. So if you'll go ahead and um, read that for next week, we just don't have time to to read all the the scripture and then get through the text as uh, as we'd like to. So if you remember in um, verse 10 of chapter 1, Paul is going to start addressing the problem of division in the church there at Corinth. And that division had been caused because members of the congregation um, were saying they were disciples of particular men, of Paul, of Peter, um, of Apollos. And apparently that was based on who had baptized them. But whatever the reason was that they were dividing into this group, these groups, um, they were not working together, and they were um, not doing things for the good of the whole. And so in chapter 13, where we actually want to pick up um, this morning, he's going to ask three questions, three rhetorical questions to try to make this point to them. He says, first of all, is Christ divided? Is Christ divided? Um, divided into groups, or is Christ divided in, into factions? Uh, what we're going to see in chapter 12 is that, that Paul is going to use the physical body to illustrate um, that the church can't function the way it needs to unless all the parts are working together. So Christ is not divided. Um, he asks, was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized into the name of Christ? And again, the answer there is no. The, the point is, I think, that he's trying to make is that your allegiance, your loyalty needs to be to Christ. He's the one who died for you. He's the one you were baptized um, into. And so he's the one that you need to, to focus on. And so what I think Paul is trying to do here, he's trying to take the focus off of um, the teacher's that they were looking at, and he's trying to put the focus back where it needed to be. He's trying to put the focus on, on Christ um, and on the gospel. And so he goes on there in verse 14, and he says that because of this, I was glad that I didn't baptize many of you. I only baptized Crispus and Gaius and the household of Stephanus. <clears throat> and he says... Uh, Therefore, God did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Um, so you're probably aware that um, some people will use this verse to argue against uh, the necessity of baptism, that they will say it's not important. Um, if you do that, I think you're taking this whole section out of out of context. This is a, a, one of those statements that we've talked about before. It's a not-but statement. So uh, the first part of the statement is emphasized, but that does not um, exclude the other part. So what Paul is saying here is that his primary duty was to preach the gospel. That is the function or the duty that God gave him. But that didn't mean that he couldn't or didn't baptize people because, in fact, we see um, that he did. There's a good example of that, I think, in John chapter 4, in the first uh, couple of verses of John chapter 4. Um, it, it's talking there about, about Jesus and uh, when he was um, in the first part of his ministry. That says, uh, or John says, now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and parted for Galilee. And so what John is telling us is that, yes, Jesus was baptizing, but in fact, his disciples were doing the actual immersion. They were doing the actual baptism. And so the same thing is true here. Um, with Paul, he is in no way diminishing uh, the necessity of, of baptism as far as salvation goes. And again, his concern, I think, in stating it this way, is that the division 
was being caused by uh, the fact that they were following after the one who had, had uh, baptized them. And so he says he's glad that no one could say they had been baptized into his name. Apparently, there were some that were claiming that Paul was trying to start his own group. He was starting his own cult. And so he's saying, I'm glad that no one can say that. Um, and so in verse 17, he goes on to say that the preaching of the gospel was not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross be emptied of its power. Um, Paul didn't teach the way that the uh, Greek philosophers uh, did. They, they used eloquence. They used uh, words of uh, uh, eloquent speech and human reasoning. And Paul didn't teach that way. This is going to be a recurring theme throughout the rest of chapter 1 and chapter 2, and we'll see that in just a minute. But, but if man, if saying if man could save himself, through human wisdom, through human reasoning, then he would have reason to be proud of himself. Uh, he says that Jesus' sacrifice would have been unnecessary. Uh, in fact, in verse 17, he says, it would have lost its power to save, if that were true, if man could save himself. But in fact, the real power is in the cross um, and in the crucifixion and Jesus' sacrifice. And so fortunately, we do not have to depend on uh, human philosophy or wisdom for salvation. Okay, let me just stop right there and see if anybody has any um, comments. That was where we were supposed to get to last week. Okay. Yes, Scott. Um, I think it's this passage right here. I mean, it's sad because uh, in some ways because... I think the way the world would see Christianity is what this passage argues against. Yeah. Um, because Christianity, as the world sees it, is so divided, many of which have followed after various men and their teaching and philosophies uh, to create their own quote-unquote branch of um, Christianity. Christianity really is meant to be simple. Yeah. We're all just meant to be followers of Christ um, that's the first thing I would say. And the second thing is, is obviously baptism had some importance because that's where they're aligning, who they're aligning to. So they did see it as it, it, it people that would argue that, that, uh, this means baptism is not essential or an important part of the message. I think missed the point as you were saying, because it, it obviously had some importance because that's how they were aligning themselves yeah. was which teacher baptized me. And that's why Paul was grateful um, for that, but it, it's just unfortunate that we, um, we, in our take home messages, we just need to preach Christ, just preach Christ. It's yeah. that simple. Yeah. We just need to preach Christ and leave everything else to, to God. I think that's a good point. Okay. So in the rest of chapter one, um, starting there in verse 18, he's going to briefly leave this, uh, discussion of division. He's going to come back to it in chapter three. But starting in verse 18 down through the end of, of chapter 2, he's going to contrast human wisdom um, with God's wisdom. And I think that is because of the fact that the Corinthians were placing so much emphasis on these um, particular men, and maybe even more so because, as we know, in, in, in Greek culture, uh, human uh, philosophy and human wisdom was very highly prized. And so I think he's trying to make a clear distinction uh, between the two. He's going to emphasize it over and over uh, in this next section. He's going to give us a lot of examples uh, to point out the fact that God's wisdom is superior um, to man's wisdom. And so in verse 18, he says, the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And so what we see is, is um, the gospel is going to have different effect on different people, uh, depending on, on their, their response to it. Um, so what Paul taught, he says, um, he taught this story of the cross. 
of, of crucifixion, of a Savior who was um, crucified. And to some people, that was absurd. That was illogical. And so they refused to even um, consider it. And because of that, he says they were lost. They were spiritually um, dead. And it seems that um, these people in this culture that were doing that thought they were smarter um, than God. They thought they had all the answers, that they didn't need God. Now, doesn't that sound like some people today? Um, there are a lot of people today who just think that um, they have all the answers, and basically they, they think that, that the gospel, the, the word of God, is only accepted by um, uneducated or simple-minded um, people. And so they ridicule those who um, believe in the Bible. They ridicule those who believe in a, in a creator. And so, you know, I think we face the same kind of thing that people in the first century did. Um, we got the same kind of problems that, that they did in terms of people uh, not being willing to, to listen to the gospel. But he goes on there and he says, in truth, uh, that those being saved, the, to those being saved, the gospel is the power of God. And I think he says that best in, um, in Romans 1.16 that we all know. Uh, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And so that just goes along with what he's saying here. All those who realize they are in a, a sinful condition, all those who realize they need help to be saved, um, all those who obey his word are, um, are going to be saved. And so again, the gospel is going to produce uh, different results in people. It's the same gospel, you know, like we talked about before. You just preach the gospel. Some people are going to obey it, and some people are going to reject it. And again, all we have to do, all we have is the responsibility to, to teach it and let God uh, give the increase. He goes on then in, in verse 19 and quotes from Isaiah uh, 29 and 14 to show that that God doesn't need human strength. He doesn't need human reasoning to accomplish um, his goals. Uh, in fact, his wisdom, he says in verse 9, shows how weak and how worthless um, human wisdom is. And to illustrate that, he's going to, in verse 20, he's going to ask, uh, what have these supposedly wise people um, that you admire so much done to solve all the problems um, that the world faces. Um, so um, I am behind on my slides. So what have, what have these people done? Uh, what have the wise done? That's the philosophers of the day. You know, they have grand ideas. Um, they have uh, big words. But what have they done um, to help man? What about the scribes, the scholars, and the intellectuals? Uh, the people that think they have all the answers. What have they done um, to help man out? What about the great debaters um, who are so eloquent that you admire them so much? Have any of these people done anything um, to make the world better? And, of course, the answer, again, is no. In fact, um, because they haven't been done anything they're the ones who look foolish. Uh, they're the ones who, who haven't accomplished anything because, you know, we still have the same problems today that they did then, right? Uh, we still have wars. We still have um, crime. We still have violence and injustice. So uh, they haven't improved man's situation at all. In fact, I would uh, argue that they have made it, uh, made it worse. And, and certainly... That's in a physical sense, and certainly they haven't done anything to um, meet man's spiritual needs either. So all the wisdom um, that man thinks he possesses, thinks he's so smart, all of that is foolish and worthless. And it's even harmful um, when it's compared to God's wisdom. And I think we can see that in the world today, because what you see in the world today is man is... is um, forgetting God and going his own way. And I think we can see uh, 
clearly the result of that in the world today. So because of that, in verse 21, he says, man is never going to find God uh, through me- means of human reasoning. Uh, and more than that, I think in Romans, uh, the first chapter of Romans, man even refuses. Uh, he, he's not, he's not going to find man through human wis- wisdom, but he even refuses to accept the evidence that God has provided for his existence, even though we're uh, even though we're surrounded for it. And that's in Romans chapter 1. I'm not going to read all that, but I do want to read part of it um, in Romans chapter 1 and starting in verse um, 18. He says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has, uh, has shown to them uh, for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and in their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fu- uh, fools. And so because of this uh, attitude they had, because of this refusal to accept the evidence that God has given us, he says here in Romans that they did not honor God, and because of that, they have no excuse, and they have become fools. And so that just goes along with what he says back in in 1 Corinthians 21, um, that because of that attitude, that because of that stubbornness, God was determined not to let man find him through human wisdom, and instead he was going to use a plan for our salvation that those wise in human terms would consider illogical um, and foolish. And I think he did that to save those. He says he did that to save those who save those who believe, and that is those whose obedience um, is genuine and sincere, and those who obey with humility and submission, uh, not those who are looking for um, glory for themselves and think that they know more um, than God. Okay, any thoughts up to that point? Okay. But what we see in verse 22 is that it wasn't just the Greek intellectuals um, who had this problem, who who wouldn't accept um, Christ. In verse 22, we see that the Greeks and the Jews both had a problem um, with Christ and his crucifixion. So he says the Jews were always demanding a miraculous sign from heaven as proof. So apparently this has to do more with some kind of really uh, big, what they would consider a really big miracle, maybe the you know, the, the dividing of the Red Sea or something uh, like that. Uh, they wanted something like that. But what we're told in John chapter 12 and verse 37 is that though he, that is Christ, had done so many signs before them, they still did not um, believe in him. And so they refused to do all the believe in him because of all the, the miracles he had done, and they refused to believe even the greatest miracle of all time, and, and, and so uh, his resurrection. And so to the Jews, um, the gospel became something that they stumbled over and something that they uh, violently opposed. But he says in verse 23 that it wasn't just the Jews that the gospel didn't make sense to. It didn't make sense to the, to the Gentiles either or to the, to the Greeks. And so what he says here is, um, again, they wanted proof through human reasoning. Um, They wanted something that they could discuss, something they could debate. And so this is very much like, if you remember when Paul was in Athens, um, the Athenians were always wanting to hear something new uh, that they could learn and something they could debate. And so uh, these people here in Corinth were very much like that. So both the Jews and the Gentiles in general had a, a problem um, accepting 
the gospel. Again, I would say that uh, if we look at, at the Greeks, again, we can probably see some of that in our, our society today. People are always wanting proof. People are always wanting to go to science to prove something. And so they refuse to accept uh, something that to them seems illogical and absurd. So fortunately, uh, in verse 24, he says that all who accept in faith and obedience, whether they're Jews or whether they're Gentiles, can be um, saved through Christ. So again, what man calls a foolishness, what man calls God's foolishness, is wiser than man's plans because, uh, first of all, man can't comprehend God's plans, but secondly of all, because God's plans are wiser because they, in fact, do provide us um, with salvation. Okay, let's move on to uh, verse 26. So, um, in verse 26, um, he's going to continue with this, this idea, and he's going to go along and uh, give us an example of those who um, are going to accept the gospel and those who are going to, to refuse the, exo- uh, the gospel. He says, so look at yourselves. So how many of you that have obeyed the gospel there in Corinth are wise or powerful or n- are of noble birth in human terms? And, and so the answer is not many. Uh, probably, you know, most of them were of, of lower um, social status. There might have been a few that were were of that uh, higher level, but most of them were uh, of of a lower uh, social standing. And so, it seems like that the world considers, or those that the world considers uh, wise and successful, are the the ones that are least likely to obey the gospel. Uh, why do you think that is? Why is it that the, those that are that are successful or rich or or are brilliant in human terms? Why is it that those are the people that are so um, not willing to accept the gospel? Uh, the Waltons over here. I think in many ways because. They are wise and successful. They don't feel like they have any need um, for something as simple or as foolish as the salvation that comes through the gospel of Jesus Christ. They don't feel like they, they, they need that. They feel like they've accomplished what they wanted to accomplish in life, and they don't need anything or anybody other than their wisdom and accomplishments and all their, all their success. And I know a lot of people like that. Well, I was going to comment on verse 22 when it says the Jews require a sign. The Israelites had 40 years of signs, and that still didn't satisfy them. So I think most people don't want to be under subjection to someone else. They, they're too independent, and that's why they come up with all these different religions to cover everybody's desires and nothing we can do as long as they have that kind of attitude they're not going to bow to God or Christ they, they want to be saved but they don't want to give up the right. things that they're doing in their life and, and again like, like Steve said they, they just don't feel um, that they have a need they have everything that they, they want Kyle I think the answer is need on their part. They don't have it. I think another way of saying it is there's no humility in their art. So they can't, uh, they'd rather conquer other men's ideas with their ideas than let uh, the God of the universe conquer them uh, by submitting to him and obeying and coming to an understanding of him. So I think it's a serious lack of humility. I think we look at the Beatitudes, blessed are they that are poor in spirit. Uh, I think those are the ones that 
recognize they have needs they can't supply. They're not poor people. They are. They know they have needs of something spiritual. Right. Um, and so I think both humility and uh, need are the expression here that we should apply to uh, those, even in our day, that raising the crescendo of debate uh, to all kinds of uh, thoughts and possibilities that are evil um, is what we're seeing uh, in every generation, but it's certainly in front of us and in our face today. Yeah, that's a good point, and I think um, I think it's something we need to be aware of as well. I mean, we are by and large made up of very successful people, very educated people, um, and I think we could all consider ourselves to be rich. And so I think it's just something that that could happen to us, maybe without even realizing it. That you know we're beginning to think that that uh, we don't need God, that we are. Are uh, able, we're self-sufficient, and so I just think that's something that we need to uh, be aware of. Um, for the mic. Yeah, I can't, I can't help but think that what we're talking about is a particular problem in Brazos County uh, with with the university around, because yeah. there are very smart people, and but they're smart in their own way. Right. And I, I, have, I have found through the years that some of the very smartest are also the most humble. Humble, That is, they know what they don't know. Yeah. Um, in fact, I will say that the people who are most receptive to, to a resurrection turned out to be the physicists, not Hawking's. But our physicists that we have, that that is the most receptive group that I've found in the entire town. And the other thing I worry about a lot is it's kind of in the Corinthians. I think about in those in the days when all of this was happening, you really could identify the enemy. I mean, or who you were having to fight. I, the the prayer about being more militant. You at least knew who who you were fighting against. It was primarily the Jews, the Greeks. It was everybody but you. But now we have so many groups that are quote Christians. We almost are having uh, getting in a circle and shooting each other. Yeah. And uh, it it's hard to you have to identify where you want to put your efforts. Do you go completely outside or do you get just go close to you? And that's that's an issue that I think hopefully we'll figure out better than the Corinthians did. Yeah. Okay. Well, in order to um, prevent this attitude that that they were having, this attitude that they were uh, they were better um, from man depending on himself when it comes to salvation in twenty seven through twenty nine. He's going to show us that salvation doesn't come through the, man, the things that man considers important. You know, if we were choosing a plan uh, for salvation, uh, we wouldn't come up with the plan that God did, would we? We wouldn't. Uh, we'd probably choose things like the most intelligent or the most uh, the, the the highest social position or influence um, or our ancestry, uh, things like that. But instead. Paul says that God chose things that man considers uh, foolish. He did that to shame those who think they're so wise, um, to show them that they're really, not, they're really not wise at all. They lack wisdom. He chose things that are weak and to, cho- to shame those who think they are, they are strong. And to, he chose things that are despised by the world um, to shame those who think they are superior um, to others, uh, and when he uses this, that word "despised," I think it, it points out that that one of the biggest groups, or, or a lot of people in the church, were slaves, and slaves were absolutely despised by society at that time. They were considered to be the lowest of the low, and so again, God chose these things to show how worthless the things that man values are so that no one would have room to brag uh, 
um, that he could save himself. <clears throat> okay, so he's going to go on in verse um, 30, and he's going to contrast that with what God has done. Um, instead of the worthless, worthless things of the world, he says in verse 30 that God has provided uh, the answers. He's provided salvation uh, through Christ. It shows his, uh, the wisdom of God in that he has provided salvation um, to us through a crucified Christ. It shows us or it, it provides righteousness, righteousness to us. Um, Christ is the source of righteousness. He's the one who justified us um, from our sins and declared us uh, innocent. He is the one who sanctified us. Uh, he made us pure and holy and set us apart. And he is the one that redeemed us. Uh, he bought us back from slavery um, to sin through that sacrifice on the cross and, and freed us. So instead, in verse, uh, in, at the end there, in, uh, he says, quoting from Jeremiah 9 and 24, instead of boasting in men, we should boast only in God and give glory to God because he is the one who saves. Okay, so any comments on chapter 1? Okay. In chapter 2, um, starting in verse 1, Paul is going to begin uh, making a presentation or talking about basically his presentation as compared to um, wh what the Corinthians um, were used to. So he's going to point out the differences in his content and the style of his teaching as compared to um, the Greek philosophers. In verse 1 he says he didn't teach them with what he calls superiority of speech or, or superior wisdom which is something I think he's comparing to what a, a Greek orator might, might do. He says he refused to take that kind of approach when he was preaching the truth. And instead, he was focused completely on um, the crucified Christ. He was focused completely on Jesus um, and his crucifixion because that is the central message of the gospel. And so that's one difference between his teaching and the teaching of the, the Greek philosophers. In verse 3, um, he shows us another difference. Um, he says, he came to them in weakness and in fear, um, and that attitude um, would be in stark contrast um, to the Greek philosophers because they were always looking for ways to, to show their superiority and their, their arrogance. And so uh, in 2 Corinthians 10 and 10, Paul says, some of the Corinthians even claimed that his bodily presence was weak uh, and that his speech was of no account. So it came to them, he says, in weakness and fears. Let's just think about um, what Paul went through before he, um, before he came to Corinth. Remember where he was? Uh, when we talked about it yesterday, where did he, where did he come through uh, on his way to Corinth? Remember? What happened to uh, Paul in Philippi, for example? So he was, he was beaten, he was put in jail, and then he went to Thessalonica, and he was run out of Thessalonica, um, and then he went to Athens, and so in Athens... Basically, he taught them there, and he was uh, pretty much ridiculed for the things that he said there. And so, uh, and now he's coming to Corinth, which is probably the most wicked city in the ancient world. And so I think, you know, Paul had reason to think that, that uh, he was going to face uh, opposition uh, in Corinth. And so he had reason if you will, to come in fear and in weakness. Uh, but that didn't prevent him from preaching um, the gospel. And he's going to say that he preached the gospel with uh, the power 
of the Holy Spirit. He didn't rely on human uh, speech. He didn't rely on uh, persuasive um, arguments. He relied on the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit um, had provided him with the knowledge that he needed and given him uh, the Word of God, and, and that was proved by the miracles that he performed, and also by the gifts uh, of the Holy Spirit that, that had been given to them. So all this was done to produce faith and trust in God uh, and to show them that he has the power to save us and that they should not lean on human wisdom. All right, anybody have any uh, thoughts that you want to make on the first five, um, first five verses of chapter 2? <clears throat> yes. That was fast. <laughs> um, just a couple of things. I know that um, in my previous work in research, the informed consent process had to occur in a language that was understandable by on a sixth grade level. And the reason for that is because people who come to you who are much smarter than you and speak lofty and use big words and f philosophize elegantly f make you feel like it's unreachable for you. Yeah. And if you put it on somebody's level and they realize that, well, if he can do it, then maybe I can do it. You know, if it's good enough for him and he can rely on God, even in his meek and meager state, meek and uh, meager state, then so can I. Yeah, I mean, there's a danger that we have in, um, I think, in looking at these these supposedly, I'm going to say supposedly smart people. Um, and think, well, if they believe this um, and, and they have all this proof that they say they have, then we should probably believe that too. But if you look at it, there's really not that proof there. So I think that's a danger that we do have to be careful about. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, I, I, personally, to me, this comes down to a trust issue. Um, you know, today, it's no different today. We see things on television uh, in a commercial that make us think a certain way because of who a person is. So the, the one that comes to my mind right off the bat is, you know, Tiger Woods trying to talk about selling a car. I know that's kind of a dumb example, but if you think about it, because he's famous or popular or knows something, people tend to think, well, they know something else. Or because they went a certain way, you should go that way too. But yet what you see here is people tend to, to you know, build people up or put value behind their beliefs based on something they may be good at. And reality is wisdom's failing too. You know, you look at these kind of things and you think to yourself, well, if, if you're always chasing somebody who's not focused on Christ, where are you at? You're lost. Yeah, um, again, I think that's a danger. And, and, but he's going to go on and say, you know, this wisdom that they have, it's temporary. You know, it changes. I mean, it changes all the time. Um, science changes all the time. Uh, theories that were fact just a few years ago have, have fallen apart because of new discoveries. So those are things that we need to, that we need to uh, be uh, aware of. And that, that leads us into the next section, 6 through 13, because he's going to say, you know, he didn't teach uh, a human wisdom. He didn't teach the kind of wisdom that came uh, for man, he taught a different kind of wisdom, uh, a wisdom that came from above, a wisdom that only those who were spiritually mature, who were willing to listen to the gospel, would, would accept. And so uh, it's not a wisdom that would come from man, uh, again, just based on what we said, not based on how powerful the man was or how influential he was. Because, again, that kind of wisdom and those people are temporary. It's not going to last. So, so he taught a wisdom that was eternal, uh, not something that was uh, going to change in a couple of years. And further, he says, 
that he taught a mystery, or a, uh, I think some of the versions say a secret. Uh, it had been a secret in the past. It had been a, a mystery previously in that it had not been, um, it had been hidden, but now uh, it has been revealed to man. And so he talks about this in Ephesians chapter 3 and 1 through 6. We're not going to look at that because we don't, we don't have time, but uh, the mystery was obviously that God was going to make salvation available to everyone, not just the Jews. And he was going to do that through um, the crucifixion uh, of Christ. And he says this was a plan that had been conceived by God before creation. It had always been his plan. It was not just a fallback position, but it had always been his, his plan. And so um, he knew exactly what was going to happen. But he says the, the leaders of the day, the Roman leaders, the Jewish leaders, um, they didn't understand this plan because if they had understand, uh, understood it, they would have never uh, crucified Christ. So he goes on in verse 9 and quotes from Isaiah 64 to show that man didn't understand the plan before it was revealed by God. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and stop there at verse 10 um, because we only have like less than a minute to go, and I see people coming. So uh, what we want to do next week is we want to finish up um, the last six or seven verses of um, chapter 2 and then do chapter 3, and we'll see how far we can get. Thank you very much.